Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight. We've been working our way through the book of Exodus on these Wednesday evenings, and we are now in Exodus chapter 26. So we want to invite you to turn with us to Exodus chapter 26 in your own copy of the Bible if you can, and we invite you to join us there. We'll be there in just a moment. If you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But again, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So the people have left Egypt. They have received the Ten Commandments. And tonight we continue with God's instructions on how to build a tabernacle. And tabernacle is not a word that we use too often these days, but a tabernacle was basically just a tent. It was a tent that was intended to be used for worship. And up to this point, we've had God's command to take up a free will offering to come up with the supplies that are needed to build this tabernacle. And then we've had the instructions for the Ark of the Covenant, the Table of Showbread, and then also the lampstand. And we've looked at some pictures from the ancient world, including those that were carved on the Arch of Titus there in the downtown city of Rome, commemorating Rome's conquering of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So we've had some kind of a, like a historical confirmation of those items at least existing. But tonight we continue with some of the fabric and the partitions and the coverings for the tabernacle. So this is uh, not a huge chapter, so I'm thinking that our study should be a little bit shorter tonight than it is on most nights. So let's jump right into it tonight with the first paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 26, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 6. Exodus 26 verses 1 through 6. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twisted linen and blue and purple and scarlet material. You shall make them with cherubim the work of a skillful workman. The length of each curtain shall be twenty-eight cubits, and the width of each curtain four cubits. All the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains shall be joined to one another, and the other five curtains shall be joined to one another. You shall make loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain in the first set, and likewise you shall make them on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in the second set. You shall make fifty loops in the one curtain, and you shall make fifty loops on the edge of the curtain that is in the second set. The loops shall be opposite each other. You shall make fifty clasps of gold, and join the curtains to one another with the clasps so that the tabernacle will be a unit. So again, let's remember that we are dealing with a tent, a mobile worship facility, and this tent is designed to be highly portable. It is a magnificent facility. We'll see that as we continue through these chapters. But it is indeed a tent, and so it is to be portable. And the aspect we focus on now is that it is surrounded or enclosed by tin curtains. And these are very intricately designed. The fabric is to be twisted linen, blue and purple and scarlet. And these linen curtains are to be woven with cherubim embedded in the fabric. And I know it's easy to forget this when we think about the tabernacle, but it was not plain at all. It was... Uh, very decorative. It was very neat looking. Well, we also find in verse 1 that these curtains are to be created by a skillful workman. So I just want to emphasize here, this is not some kind of uh, do-it-yourself project to be uh, completed after watching a couple YouTube videos, but instead Moses is to find the best of the best. And yes, in a group of two to three million people, most had been slaves working on making bricks for the past several hundred years. But apparently some were able to keep up with their skills through the years as various crafts were perhaps passed down from one generation to the next. And so they were to find a skilled workman to create this fabric. Well, in verse 2, we start to have some dimensions in cubits, of course with a cubit being roughly 18 inches, the distance from a man's elbow to the tips of his finger. And to me, it's really hard to picture this, but we do know from looking at the figures in the rest of the chapter that the tabernacle itself is to face towards the east. And so there is to be one outer door in this tent, and it is to point toward the east. We also learn that the tabernacle itself is to be 15 feet wide, 
by 15 feet tall by 45 feet long, just converting those cubits into measurements that most of us would understand today. And in this passage, we find that the ten curtains are to be connected into what appears to me at least to be two large panels of five curtains each. They are to be made with loops, and that therefore allows these curtains to be connected with clasps or connectors of gold. Remember, uh, this is a, a large piece of fabric, and so it was made to be portable. It was made to be where it could be taken apart. So it was not one giant piece of fabric all at uh, one piece, uh, but it was in sections that could be separated for ease of transportation. And, and just picturing this in my own mind, we'll find later that the Levites are in charge of this. So I'm imagining that certain people and perhaps teams of people being responsible for each piece of this. So in my mind, at least, there would have been a, uh, you know, a curtain segment number one team. Then there would have been a curtain segment number two team and so on. And so when they show up at night after traveling all day, when it was time to deploy the tabernacle, uh, the people responsible maybe for carrying these items would spring into action and they would set it up. And then they would also do the same thing to take it down. But that's just me imagining this and trying to picture Moses uh, getting this done in, uh, in an efficient manner. So uh, quite the logistical nightmare, but uh, he, he had a handle on it and God designed it in a way. Uh, this is what it was intended to do. So it was a decent sized tent. And I'm just assuming that each person uh, would have had their own particular role in putting it up and taking it down. And they would have gotten pretty good at that uh, in a hurry. Uh, one of my favorite memories setting up a tent in our family was back when our daughter was young. I don't know. I can't remember if she was seven or eight years old, give or take a few years. And we pulled into Ridgeway State Park over there in southwest Colorado. It was summer. Uh, we had just driven through a mountain pass that had snow on the ground. So this is like July or August. This was uh, the pass was just south of Ure, Colorado. And we were traveling north, so now we're north of Ure. We've had dinner in Ure. It's dark, and we're pulling into Ridgeway State Park, and we're setting up the tent in uh, blowing rain that night. It was just right on the verge of being freezing rain, which was <laughs> amazing to me for August or the middle of summer. And we're in the mountains, so all kinds of unknown sights and sounds and smells and, and stuff. And, and my daughter was my trusty assistant that night, and uh, her job was to hold the flashlight. <laughs> but as I took the tent out of its bag, you know, stuff is blowing around. There's tent pegs coming out, and, you know, the tent fly in the base of it, and there's uh, lines and that. And she would hear something in the trees over to the side, and she would turn toward it along with the flashlight, which of course meant that I was completely blind for a moment. In the dark, in the freezing rain, the wind blowing the tent all over the place, and I couldn't see a thing at that point. And so I'd have to remind her, you know, sweetie, no matter what happens, <laughs> you have to shine the light on daddy's hands. So just, you know, focus the light wherever my hands are, that's where the flashlight needs to point. And we got it done, but I think it was the next day that we went out and we found a headlamp. We started looking for something that could go on the forehead there. And uh, through the years, I have purchased many headlamps, uh, some for myself, some for family, some for others, friends, members of the congregation. I've given some of you headlamps through the years. And, uh, you know, if you do anything outdoors, uh, headlamps make a great gift. You need one for the car, one for your backpack, one for beside the bed, and uh, you can almost never have enough headlamps. But uh, anyway, years later, I saw a meme that said something like, you can't scare me, I've held a flashlight for my dad. And uh, our daughter might be able to uh, say something like that. But anyway, uh, this is what comes to mind, at least my mind, when I think of setting up a massive tent in the wilderness. And I say that to emphasize that everybody would have most likely had their own part to play in this. And everybody would have had their own job to do uh, for the sake of efficiency, for the sake of getting it done. So let's continue on then with Exodus chapter 26. And the next paragraph is verses 7 through 14. Exodus 26, verses 7 through 14. Then you shall make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. You shall make eleven curtains in all. The length of each curtain shall be thirty cubits, and the width of each curtain four cubits. The eleven curtains shall have the same measurements. You shall join five curtains by themselves, and the other six curtains by themselves. 
and you shall double over the sixth curtain at the front of the tent. You shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in the first set, and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in the second set. You shall make 50 clasps of bronze, and you shall put the clasps into the loops and join the tent together so that it will be a unit. The overlapping part that is left over in the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that is left over, shall lap over the back of the tabernacle, the cubit on one side and the cubit on the other of what is left over in the length of the curtains of the tent shall lap over the sides of the tabernacle on one side and on the other to cover it. You shall make a covering for the tent of ram skins uh, dyed red and a covering of porpoise skins above. So now we come to the outer cover covering. And in any tent, of course, it's important that water not get in. And today, uh, tents have been so much better now than they were just 20 years ago. We have rain flies, uh, all kinds of great technology today that we didn't have too long ago. Uh, but that's what this outer cover seems to be for, to keep the rain and the weather out of the uh, interior of this tent. And it looks to me as if we have several layers, uh, curtains of goat's hair, and we have measurements for all of these panels. Uh, with a uh, note that they are to overlap in certain areas, almost like shingles, but this would be the curtains, so kind of going sideways. You know, we've got the clasps of bronze holding these panels together, and then on top of the goat hair panels, we've got this layer of ram skins dyed red and a covering of porpoise skins above that. Just imagine the weight of all of that. These are not lightweight materials. Today in backpacking, being lightweight is extremely important. Everybody's measuring in grams every little thing they take on a hike. Uh, but this is some uh, very heavy material we're talking about. Well, not just that, but it's interesting to me also that the outer and the most waterproof layer is made from the skins of animals that live in the water. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Of all skins that should be able to repel water, you would think that porpoise skin should be able to get it done. But the other thing that gets my attention is how bloody the process of building the tabernacle must have been. Animals do not donate their skins to a project. You know, certainly the goat hair might have been harvested without bloodshed, perhaps, but, uh, you know, not so with the ram skins and the porpoise skins. You know, animals had to die for this tabernacle to be constructed, which reminds me of what God did when Adam and Eve sinned by eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember when they realized that they were naked, Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with the leaves, but that didn't quite do it, so God gave them animal skins to cover themselves. And we may not always think about that, but that was most likely the first time that an animal or animals had to die for human sin. God didn't make them something made out of wool, where the wool could be trimmed off a sheep and the, and the sheep lives. No, God made them clothing from the skins of animals. An animal or animals had to die back there in the Garden of Eden. So blood was shed as a result of sin. And I would just note, so also with the tabernacle. Well, let's continue with Exodus 26, verses 15 through 30. The next paragraph here. Exodus 26 Verses 15 through 30. Then you shall make the boards for the tabernacle of acacia wood standing upright. Ten cubits shall be the length of each board and one and a half cubits the width of each board. There shall be two tenons for each board fitted to one another. Thus you shall do for all the boards of the tabernacle. You shall make the boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the south side. You shall make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under one board for its two tenons, and two sockets under another board for its two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, 20 boards, and there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. For the rear of the tabernacle to the west, you shall make six boards. You shall make two boards for the corners of the tabernacle at the rear, they shall be double beneath, and together they shall be complete to its top, to the first ring. Thus it shall be with both of them, they shall form the two corners. There shall be eight boards with their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. Then you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards of one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the rear side to the west. The middle bar in the center of the board shall pass through from end to end. 
You shall overlay the boards with gold and make their rings of gold as holders for the bars. And you shall overlay the bars with gold. Then you shall erect the tabernacle according to its plan which you have been shown in the mountain. Well, here we get to what I believe would be on the inside of the tabernacle. Again, we don't have a diagram here, so we're kind of piecing this together. But underneath all of the curtains, underneath the goat hair, underneath the ram skins and the porpoise skins, we're talking on the inside, we have these boards. And you think, okay, well, this is kind of a pointless passage for us to study today. What, what's interesting in here, I just want to point out, these are gold-covered boards. So these are made of acacia wood, like the ark itself, and they're covered with gold, as the ark was to be covered. And notice they are to be fit together, I think we would say, with uh, mortise and tenons. Not tendons, <laughs> like in the human body, but tenons, so uh, protrusions that stick out into a socket or a slot of some kind uh, to form the joint. And one thing that surprised me is that each board is 10 cubits long. So if you do the math on that, 10 cubits, that would have been 15 feet tall. So imagine a 15 foot tall board. But what is truly surprising, something I didn't realize until looking at this again, is that these boards are one and a half cubits wide. Remember, a cubit is 18 inches. So 18 inches plus half of that when we do the math there, if I've done it correctly, each board would have been 27 inches wide. That is a huge board. Now think about the weight of a gold-covered plank, 15 feet long by 27 inches wide. We don't have the thickness of the board, whether it's a, you know, a 1 by 27 or a 2 by 27. Um, but regardless of how thick that board is, that is a long and a very heavy piece of wood. It is still carryable. They can still take this through the wilderness. It might take several people, might have to put it on an animal. Um, but I'm just saying, this is a rather large board. And I, I didn't really think about that before we studied tonight's lesson. The other thing that impresses me yet again is the weight of just all of this. Again, yes, it's portable. But this thing, the whole thing, would have been extremely heavy and yes it is portable in the sense that it can be taken apart into uh, hundreds of pieces that were all carried separately but there is a lot of material in this structure isn't there the gold the silver the animal skins the curtains uh, the cloth the sockets all of this and bars of course that uh, would go through the rings uh, to assemble all of this rather quickly well we have instructions now as to how all of these boards are to be fit together and then we have this statement there at the end then you shall erect the tabernacle according to its plan, which you have been shown on the mountain. And I don't know about you, but that sounds to me like God perhaps showed Moses some kind of a vision as to what the tabernacle was to actually look like. So it's not just the written record. The written record gives us the measurements. Uh, but in addition to the written record, it seems that Moses perhaps was given some kind of image, uh, some kind of vision. He could see this. He could see what it was supposed to look like so he could provide some guidance as they put it together. Let me know what you think about that, uh, but that's what I get out of verse 30. Here are the measurements, but make it exactly like I showed you. Not like I told you, but like I showed you on the mountain. Well, let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph. This is Exodus 26, and we'll be looking at verses 31 through 37. Exodus 26, 31 through 37. You shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. It shall be made with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. You shall hang it on four pillars of acacia wood with gold, their hooks also being of gold on four sockets of silver. You shall hang up the veil under the clasps and shall bring in the ark of the testimony there within the veil. And the veil shall serve for you as a partition between the holy place and the holy of holies. You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the holy of holies. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand opposite the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the doorway of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, the work of a weaver. You shall make five pillars of acacia for the screen and overlay them with gold.
their hooks also being of gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. As I understand it, we are now talking about the partition between the holy place and the holy of holies, and we're also talking about the front door of this tent. So we're starting with the inner partition, and we find that the ark with the mercy seat on top of it is to go in this back room behind the veil, and that would be then on the west end of this tent, that would be the back of the tent. And in front of the veil, we then have the table to the north with the lampstand on the south. And so the entrance, therefore, is to always face towards the east. We have a few details concerning the loops and the, the loops and the hooks and the sockets for all of this, but that's about it for that partition. Um, as we close, just a few comments on this partition between the holy place and the holy of holies. You know, later, the basic design of the tabernacle would be uh, scaled up, I think we might say, when Solomon builds the temple, so kind of the tabernacle, but on a larger scale. That temple that Solomon built was then destroyed by the Babylonians. It was later rebuilt after they came back from captivity. It was eventually remodeled a time or two through the years, leading to what was then described as Herod's temple um, at the uh, beginning of the first century, and uh, that is the temple that would have been in use at the time of Jesus. And, um, and it is this partition between the holy place and the holy of holies that was torn in two from top to bottom at the moment Jesus died on the cross, indicating that all people now have access to God through the sacrifice of Jesus. So not the exact piece of fabric, uh, but I'm just saying the temple was based on the design of the tabernacle, would have been... Uh, kind of maybe larger and a more robust, more permanent structure right there. So just keeping that in mind, it's that basic division between the holy place and the most holy place um, that we're talking about. And by the way, we have at least one ancient writer who described that partition in the temple as being four inches thick, about the width of a, of a hand. And I don't know about you, but I don't usually think about curtains as being four inches thick. If somebody says something about a curtain, I'm thinking some flimsy piece of fabric, maybe a light darkening curtain, uh, but certainly nothing very thick at all. Uh, when we lived down in Janesville, Wisconsin, one of our members worked for Huffcor. I don't know if you've heard of Huffcor. Huffcor made operable partitions like you might see in schools or gymnasiums or even big convention centers. So if you're a school teacher and you have like a, a classroom that's divided with an accordion type door, there's a good chance that might have been made by Huffcore. Uh, gyms, I've seen them in the gyms in our area, um, convention centers, that kind of thing. And like I said, many people may refer to these as accordion doors. As I remember it, Huffcore people would get completely offended if you referred to their product as an accordion door. Um, but they, they preferred operable partition. That sounds a lot better apparently than, uh, than accordion door. But I mention this because some of those accordion doors or operable partitions, as they were known, were truly majestic. I mean, they were they were they were a huge deal. Uh, 30, 40, 50 feet tall or even more, dividing these huge convention centers into multiple rooms. And our member who worked there would sometimes go to the Middle East to either bid or help oversee the installation of some of these things. I don't remember exactly what he did, but it was tied to these operable partitions being installed overseas. He had some uh, role to play in that. But I'm just mentioning this because some of those partitions were probably four inches thick. This is a, not a curtain like we would think of a curtain today. So when I think of the curtain or the veil in the temple that was torn in two, sometimes I think of those operable partitions from Huffcor. Not a flimsy curtain, but it was a huge deal for that veil to be torn in two, especially to be torn in two from top to bottom. Uh, but this was the original partition that we're talking about. I don't think it was four inches thick like the one in the temple. Uh, but this one in the tabernacle is the one that we've been discussing in this paragraph tonight. Um, as we wrap it up, I just wanted to share a couple of pictures. Uh, this one is of a model somewhere in the world, somewhere in the Middle East, I believe. And I don't know whether you can see this, but you may be also uh, able to just barely make out one of those gold-covered planks right there on the front corner, kind of to the left of that, uh, you know, pillar right there in the middle of the picture, so to the left of that. And I think you might be able also to see some of the layers of uh, fabric and the skins uh, covering outside those planks, pr protecting the interior from the wind and the rain 
and then of course you can see the pillars across the front there that were used to hold up that uh, that curtain or the front door as we would say today and then this next or the last picture here kind of shows a reproduction of the entire tabernacle including the outer courtyard and we'll get to that soon we haven't dealt with the uh, laver we haven't dealt with the altar on the outside there, but I just wanted to show the tabernacle itself and how we really don't have all the details as to how it might have looked. You know that one we just, the uh, first picture we looked at tonight, notice how those uh, walls went straight down, but notice here they kind of go out at an angle. So again, we don't know exactly how it was designed, we just have the measurements of the materials that were used. Uh, but this is one artist rendition in the form of a model or a reproduction of, of it. All right, so this brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 26. And as I said last week, ultimately everything we've read about tonight is merely a shadow. And it's pointing toward what would come later in Jesus. According to Hebrews, Jesus is a better sanctuary, isn't he? He is our tabernacle in a sense. We come to God through Jesus the Son, our great high priest. And that would be the application tonight to be incredibly thankful for what he's done for us. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Again, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, prayer requests, let us know. And uh, give me a call, 608-224-0274, or send me a text on that number, or send an email to info at fourlinkschurch.org, and we would love to hear from you. As we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank you, Father, for your inspired message delivered to us today in written form through your servant Moses. We're thankful for this beautiful world that you have made, the sun, the rain, the warmth, and even the snow. We're thankful for every good and perfect gift that has come down to us from your hand. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, and we come to you tonight in his name. Amen.